Well, you know, a few weeks or about 10 days ago or so, uh, it happened to be a day before Easter, uh, a good friend of my wife, uh, Linda, a good friend of hers, uh, uh, who had lost her husband, her first husband, she was married, and uh, we just learned the story just uh, yesterday, but um, she, she was married for five years to the love of her life, back in, and when they were in their 20s, and he was a private uh, pilot, like he flew little small engine planes, well, one day on Thanksgiving, he crashed and burned and died right in front of her eyes. I mean, just horrific. The love of your life in your 20s, five years of marriage, crashed, burned, and died right in front of her eyes on Thanksgiving. Well, the day before Easter here, about nine or 10 days ago, uh, this woman happened to, uh, she said, uh, she can't really, she doesn't even know why she did this, but whether it's an impression or a, an idea, but somehow she got online and was searching for Keith Green music. How many are old enough to remember a man named Keith Green? Tremendous musician, really a, 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 a apostle, if you will, through uh, music. I feel like I was discipled through him back in the 80s. He was a tremendous uh, musician, not just music, but his words. He was highly committed to Christ. He discipled an entire generation of people who would listen to his music and all that, and he too was a private pilot, and he too crashed and burned with two of his kids in front of his wife, okay? And so he died very young uh, and, and, and didn't get to live a full life. So this woman, this friend of my, my wife's named Connie, she, she uh, was just got this impression, this idea of search for Keith Green online. She started looking. She found her way to some of his music and some of the old videos. Of course, this is all back in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, early 80s. And, and there was this concert, and I think if I heard the story right, it was one of his last concerts that he did. But the, but the camera panned the audience. This is just like nine days ago, looking at an old video. The camera panned the audience, and there in the audience, the camera stopped, and guess who was in the audience? Her husband. Her husband. All the way back to that day. She, the, the camera, plain as day, she was looking at her former husband when he was alive, attending a Keith Green concert. Coincidence? Some of you know the story uh, of our own, uh, or, or Linda and I, our story of, of our third child, Allie Grace, who was delivered stillborn in, back in 1995. And uh, that story, about 20, 23 weeks or so, we learned that the baby uh, was non-viable and, and Linda had to carry uh, our daughter until she died, which you can imagine, and many of you maybe have suffered miscarriages, lost children, so you know the pain of that that lingers to this day. But having to wait while those kicks diminish and go down and down, and Linda had to endure all that. She went in, this is 1995, uh, because the pregnancy had to be induced, but once the baby was confirmed um, as dead, uh, uh, she went in and she had to be induced and it was a, uh, a Good Friday. So she w went over to St. Vincent's on a Good Friday and, and it started a 48 hour process of inducing the labor. And so our daughter was delivered on Easter morning of all things, 1995, it's still in the amniotic sac. And of course back then there weren't a lot of resources. My wife later wrote a best selling book called Mommy Please Don't Cry. Uh, but I remember holding our baby in the amniotic sac in a little basket with the nun and eventually have to give it away and, and, and that's it, you know, um, and see it. But the point is that was from Good Friday to Easter, we went through that experience. Five years later, uh, my oldest daughter, Emily, was seven. My youngest daughter had been born then too, Kate. And on this day, five years later, which would have been 2000, Easter 2000, uh, Linda took them over to a woman's house here in Little Rock who had taken the time to make our daughters these beautiful Easter dresses. like. Um, they were totally embroidered and lace, and, and she was from uh, Alabama, so there's all this symbolism that they weave into the lace and, and, and stories and all that. And, and so our daughters had these dresses, and Linda went over to get them dressed, so they were there. Well, this lady lived in a very nice house in a big, huge um, kind of circular staircase, and it went down into a big uh, lobby with a grand piano. And so... Uh, they had posed our daughters on this piano bench at the end of the staircase taking these pictures. Some of you know the story. Some of you have seen this picture. But this is back in the day where, uh, again, we didn't have iPhones and instant cameras. So we had a little camera like those Instamatics, like uh, yellow things. You take the picture. You got to turn it into Walmart or Sam's Club or Target to get your film developed. So Linda had taken pictures of the girls, turned it into Target right over there on Chanel uh, by Home Depot. We get the pictures back, and we're looking through the pictures, and we come across this picture 
of our daughters, and it looks to be, at first glance, double exposed, so we're about to throw it away, and then Linda's like, wait, and she looks, and instead of being two girls in the picture, there's three girls in the picture, and all three girls have an Easter dress on, but all three girls are of different sizes and ages, so there's clearly Emily at seven, there's clearly uh, Kate at two, and you can tell because they have different uh, shoe sizes, so they have shoes on, they both have bows in their hair, but the one in the middle, uh, and Emily and Kate are facing the camera, smiling, but the one in the middle, Emily has her arm around her, and her head, you can't see her face, you can only see like this much of her face. She's looking at Emily, and she doesn't have a bow in her hair. And there's three different shoe sizes, all three girls. Crazy, and that was on Easter morning, five years after we had lost our child, or so we thought, coincidence? Or we encountering is Connie, or we is, is somehow God uh, making himself known. The fact that he didn't just live, he didn't just die, he is alive. These loved ones are alive and waiting for us in a wonderful place, a real place called heaven. Not coincidental at all that on Easter these types of things would happen. I'm sure we're not the only people. If God does things like this for Connie, God does things like this for my wife and I, surely he's doing it for you and others and all around the world. Demonstrating that Easter isn't just a holiday, so to speak. It is a celebration of his life, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. He is wonderfully alive in heaven. Coincidence? No, it's more than that. It's a gift. And communication to us in this life in a living way where we can understand that he is indeed alive. A gift from a loving father and the promise that we will one day see him and those we love again. That is, those of us who believe. Now, when you have seen him in such ways, and there's many ways we encounter God, through his word, through his creation, in these seemingly miraculous encounters that are too, too uh, uh, crazy to say they're just coincidence, right? Something's going on, something is seen. And when you've had this encounter, these experiences with God, in whatever way that is, uh, you're compelled to believe in him. You're compelled to seek him. You're compelled to live your life for him, to tell others about him, to raise your children to worship him, to endure hardship and suffering by trusting in him, and ultimately, as I said, to expect that one day you will see him face to face. When you encounter him, you experience him, you know he's alive and well, amen? And it changes your life, it changes your perspective. You know, the book of Acts tells the story of men and women who in one way or another likewise had seen him, had encountered him, had an experience with him, and more specifically, the book of Acts tells us what happened as a result of their encounter with Jesus Christ. You know, we were studying the book of Acts, we got up through about chapter 13 or so, then we called a timeout, a couple series to start the new year, then got into the uh, Easter season, Palm Sunday. We're heading back to finish the book of Acts over the next month or two, and Harry asked me today to, to try to catch us up and to overview uh, so that Alex and they can continue starting next week, and that's what I wanna do this morning, a review of the book of Acts so far from where we're at. Uh, and, 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 and to say this, that that book is not just history, but it's the story, as I said, of men and women who have had an encounter with Jesus. Most of the people in the book of Acts had never seen him physically with their eyes. Most had never walked with him or ate with him or journeyed with him, as did the apostles or his mother Mary, for instance, or his half-brothers. But other people who had never been with him physically or ever seen him, the book of Acts tells their story too and how they had had an encounter with him and how that encounter had changed their lives and their trajectory of their lives. In fact, in some cases, they even died and went all the way to death because of that experience, because no one could convince, him, convince them that he was not alive. And the book of Acts tells their story. So it tells the story of individuals, these men and women, yes, but it also tells the story of the early church, that is the DNA, how the church was established, how it began. And from that beginning, we see what the church is committed to, what it's supposed to be about. Uh, and we learn that, the DNA, DNA that set in, the early struggles of the church and how they overcome them, that group of men and women, their faith, their commitment, and their hope. You know, when we use the word church today, we take it for granted. It's a Greek word, ekklesia, and it simply means gathering. There were many ekklesias in the time of, of Rome, 
uh, 2,000 years ago. Anything could be called an ecclesia, a gathering of people. But in the New Testament, it becomes kind of a moniker for the church. I mean, that's where we get the word church from, the Greek word ecclesia. So it was a gathering of believers. And, and even when we talk about the book of Acts telling the story of the church, at once you ask yourself, what church? Right? Think about it. Because at once there's a universal church. So the universal church, uh, I'm sorry, the, the eternal church, the eternal church is every single believer prior to Jesus who looked ahead to him by faith, every person after Jesus who looks backwards to him by faith, and, and by faith have received him uh, as Savior, uh, whether 3,000 years ago, 2,000, 1,000, or if God tarries 2,000 years from now, there is at once the eternal church to which we belong, right? But then there's also the universal church. What is the universal church? The universal church is the church of the world right now. This earth that we live on at this time in human history, in this season of our lives, every single believer around the world who's living at this moment is part of what we would call the universal church, right? But then there's also what? The local church. That's what this church is, it's a local church. That's what Philip Pointer's church over at St. Mark or Kevin Kelly at, at, uh, up at Second Baptist or, or Fellowship or New Life. These are all local expressions of a universal church and ultimately of the eternal church, right? And, and that's how you think. So in the book of Acts, not only do we read the stories of men and women who encounter Jesus and because of their encounter with him, uh, th their lives were changed, but we also see how the, the universal church or how a local church grows up and starts to become a universal church where the church worldwide is known. And by the way, that's what the word Catholic means, right? I was raised Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. And for 1,500 years of church history, there was the Catholic church, the one church universally that was expressed in, in different local ways. And of course, the Protestant Reformation changed that. So all that's to say is that the, this is what the book of Acts ultimately is about. The story of men and women who encountered Christ, their lives were changed, and the story of the development first of the local church that grows into the universal church, all right? So these people had seen him. The fact is that it changed their lives, and they were willing then to endure rejection. They were willing to endure misunderstanding, hardship, struggles, and even die because they had had an encounter with Jesus. And remember, not all had seen and walked with him. They're much like us somehow. They had experienced him and knew him to be true and to be alive. C.S. Lewis, we mentioned this last week. You know, C.S. Lewis, uh, in, in terms of a philosopher, he talked about Jesus that there's only one three, uh, of three possibilities for Jesus Christ, right? He was either a liar, he was a lunatic or a lord. Lunatic's the old word, right? They thought when people had mental illness back in the day, if they looked at the moon, that they would see uh, that, that something crazy and they, they thought the moon or the rhythms of the moon would make people crazy. So that's where the word lunatic comes from. But he was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, right? So if he's a liar, what happens? Jesus says, uh, if he's a liar, that um, he knew that he was not God, okay? So he basically lied about it. He said he was God, but he knew he wasn't God. But the question is this, if you knew you weren't God, and you said everybody, and then all of a sudden you're gonna get beaten within one strap of your life, hung on a cross to die, who would do that for a lie, right? Like who would allow himself to go that far when he knew it was a lie? So that doesn't seem possible. If he's a lunatic, that is if a mental ill, crazy, back in the day, the old term, if there was something crazy about him, if you will, and I don't use that term in a condescending or pejorative way, but if he was a lunatic, then you think that the number one most influential person in the entire history of humanity was a crazy man, like crazy. So how, how feasible, how possible is that, right? So either liar, lunatic, or in fact, Lord. And we asked at Easter this question, as I typically do if I'm speaking on Easter, who do you say that he is, right? He asked that of Peter, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that he is? Is he liar? Is he a lunatic or is he Lord? And if you say he's Lord, great, and that's a moment in time and most of us have, recognized and received him as Lord in our lives. But if you receive him as Lord, today and moving forward, post-Easter, here's the question. It's not so much, this isn't the question, who do you say that I am? The question is this, how will you then live? How will you then live? If you, in fact, receive him and believe in him as Lord, the question is, how will you then live? 
And clearly, these men and these women, as told in the book of Acts, they believed the latter. Not liar, not lunatic. They believed he was Lord. And they were in the best position to make a decision about that, don't you think? Many of these people actually did live with them and travel with them and journey with them and touch them and ate with them and, 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 and all of that. Others had other encounters with him, the risen Lord. But in the first century, closest to Jesus, they were in the best position to, to, to make a decision about liar, lunatic, or Lord. And we read in Acts that they chose to believe his Lord even to the point of death beyond suffering, beyond flogging, beyond threats and harassment of their families, beyond arrest. They went to their own deaths, many of them, and many others would come later who would do so as well, believing he was Lord. So the book of Acts then is their testimony. It's their legacy. It's what, and, and as such, it becomes for us a challenge today to live lives so committed. See, ultimately, that's what they were. They were committed to him. To live lives in which we desire and choose to follow in his footsteps, to expand the church's input, impact and its influence ultimately until he returns again in glory. Shouldn't that be our commitment? It certainly was there. And he will, in fact, return. So having said all that, turn to the book of Acts, if you will, because I want to take the next 15 minutes or so to review, catch us up all the way through uh, chapter 13 so Alex and, and the folks can pick it up in the coming weeks. And, and as you're turning there, keep in mind that Acts is written by Luke. Luke is a storyteller, not a liar, not that kind of story, but he tells stories. Paul taught, he's like a seminary professor, a PhD professor at a university, but, but, but Luke is a storyteller. And, and so Luke tells the story of Jesus in what we call the Gospel of Luke, and then he tells the story of the early believers, uh, the apostles, Mary, and others, as well as the development of the early church in the book of Acts. And so in Acts chapter one, we really pick up the story in Acts 1-8 specifically, it's the end of Matthew 28. Uh, for, uh, and it says, remember in Matthew 28, we call that the Great Commission. Jesus, at the end of his life, said to the disciples, go and make disciples of all men and women, uh, baptizing them, teaching them. Acts 1-8 picks up from there, and it says, Jesus says to them, at the point of his ascension into heaven, Jesus says to his apostles, he says, and wait in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit is gonna come upon you, and when he does, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses, he says, first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. That's like saying Little Rock and to Arkansas and to that God-forsaken place called Mississippi and ultimately to the rest of the world, right? So Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, and, and this is what it's like saying, right? So this is where Acts 1-8 picks up. Now, in, in 111, these angels are there as Christ ascends. And I want to tell you some things uh, about that you may not hear in other teaching, just to kind of give you some of the glue that, that holds all this together. But in 111, you have a couple angels as these, these men, they're standing watching Jesus ascend into heaven. And then an angel come to them and they say, why do you guys stand here looking up? Like, what are you looking at? Say, this Jesus will one day return in the same way he's gone, but in the meantime, get the work, right? Get busy. Like, quit gawking and seeing. Boy, I see that in the American church. Everybody wants to study the Bible. Man, you go to church, they got Bible studies out the wazoo, small groups. There. But see, that's like, I mean, we need Bible study. Don't get me wrong. We need to learn the word and hide the word in our heart and all that, but you gotta get the work. You see what I'm saying? You gotta get busy. And I see that in 111. I mean, how much more do you need to look? How much more do you need to know? How much more do you need to study? At some point, you gotta get the work for God and get out there and get busy, right? And this church was founded on that principle. So all that's to say, Acts 111, you have this challenge from the angels. Get to work, right? Get out there and make a difference. Now, uh, 113 and following shows how Judas had to be replaced and, 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 and another apostle was chosen, someone who uh, in that time, a man, man-dominant culture in the Jewish uh, faith, uh, so a man, he had to have walked with Jesus, experienced what they did, but they choose one man to replace Judas. And this is all in a prenatal period of the church. The church is gonna be born in Acts 2 officially, uh, but there's kind of a prenatal stage. Just like in our church, our official birthday is Easter, March 31st, 2002, but Linda and I actually got after it in June of 2001. So like a baby, there's a prenatal period of growth and development, and then the baby is pushed out. So same thing was happening here. This is prenatal. And what you see, it says, it's not just these apostles, these men, but note in verse one, uh, chapter one, verse 14, it says, with the original 11, it says there were women as well, and others like Mary and the half-brothers of Jesus. So this is a bigger group, as we'll see in Acts 2. 120 people are part of this prenatal development of the church. But what I want to point out here is that leadership forms. 
So it's not just a group of just people who believe in Jesus, but there's a leadership tier that forms. Now, let me be really clear, and we, Harry and I have told you this from the beginning. Like, just because we're pastors or paid staff or whatever, it does not mean anything in terms of the difference between you and me, nothing. I'm a sinner, I struggle, all, no different. We go through hardship, everything that you do, no different. And so I wanna be clear about that. But, but God in his sovereignty and or churches have appointed us in some way to help organize the church and help get us of one mind and one heart and one spirit so that we're going in one direction to worship and to serve God together. So you see leaders are developed right here in the first chapter, uh, which will be a standard for the church going forward amongst uh, the people, right? So then it takes us to chapter two, right? And so from here it begins, as we said, the establishment of the leadership prenatal church Then the birth of the church in chapter two, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Peter preaches, goes out, you know this, the first sermon, as it were, by an apostle. 3,000 people are converted. Uh, This is where uh, the spiritual gift of tongues, which is a whole nother subject we won't talk about today, but the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They speak in languages understood by others. But what I want you to note here is chapter two, verse 15, or I'm sorry, uh, chapter two, verse five. When Peter preaches this first sermon, who does he preach to? Now, the common understanding is there's all these different people from all these different nations, and so in our terminology today, it's a multi-ethnic crowd. Uh, it's all this diverse people, and, and all these diverse people uh, come to Christ under Peter's preaching. That's not true. Look at chapter two, verse five. It says very specifically that now there were Jews living in Jerusalem. See the word Jews? There were Jews living in Jerusalem. That means they were ethnically by blood Jewish as well as had been raised in the Jewish faith. So religion and blood, they are Jews, and they're living in Jerusalem. It says devout men, of course it would have been women, male-dominated uh, time, from every nation under heaven. So that's where the every nation under heaven comes, is these Jews who had lived in other places had come. In our lifetime, we've seen that, haven't we? The di- diaspora of the Jews over 1900 years and today over since like the 50s or even before that, really in the 20th century, the return of Jews from all over the world to where? Israel, right? We see that in our lifetime. Nobody else saw that, by the way, in human history. It goes all the way back to here. We're living in those last times. But having said that, it's Jews from all these different parts who are living there. And as you read the rest of that passage there, uh, it's, it, what you have to understand is just like the Muslims go to Mecca, like in their lifetime, they're supposed to make one journey to Mecca. Um, Jews had the same thing. There were three feast days in the Jewish calendar. And so uh, devout Jews were encouraged to visit Jerusalem on these different feast days. And so during one of these feast days of Passover, there's all these Jewish people who've come from all these different regions, these different areas around the known world at the time because it's a festival, just like Muslims going to Mecca. And that's who's in town. Now it says there are some devout, uh, I'm sorry, god fears, which basically means non-Jews as a part of the crowd. But by and large, it's a Jewish crowd. Now why am I making such a point of that? Because if you listen to pastors, preachers, churches, Uh, today as it's been for many many years they make Acts chapter 2 a stopping point not a starting point for the development of the church because if I could put this in language today I'm just using one it could be all black all Korean but basically it's an all white church in Jerusalem okay and it's it's one ethnic group Jews who get saved but but the but many preachers make that as if that's where it stops you create churches for one specific group But Acts 2 is only a starting point. It's not the stopping point, as you'll see, and that's a big mistake. So all that's to say is that we learn this in Acts chapter 1. It begins, as Jesus said it would, in Jerusalem with what we would call today a homogeneous crowd, but it's going to expand. The church is going to expand. And it's going to go like from, like in a music, like from one note, right, to a few notes. So in Acts chapter one, you have one note. Acts chapter two, a couple more notes. And over the period of the book of Acts, there's gonna be more instruments added, more harmonies added, and it's gonna expand like a crescendo. So we can't get hung up on Acts chapter two as if that is the model for the church. It's not. But we do learn things about how the church is to to operate, as it were, from Acts chapter two, right? So Acts chapter two, 42, for instance, it tells us that the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, right, to prayer, to breaking bread and to fellowship. So breaking of bread would have been specifically, they had meals 
um, in that day, but it celebrated communion as Christ instituted communion. Remember me, uh, eat the bread and drink the cup and remember my death, proclaim it until I come again. This is the concept of breaking bread and fellowship. But then in Acts 4, 2.47 as well, you'd see that they were praising uh, God in the temple daily, which is kind of the concept of worship. So my point is, right here in the early, in the first church at Jerusalem, some markers, some DNA markers are gonna be set in, as it were, to the church. That there's teaching in the church, there's prayer in the church, there's fellowship, there's the celebration, the proclamation of Jesus through communion. There's praise and worship in the church. But again, these are starting points, not stopping points. In chapter three then, there's a miracle of healing. So Peter has been proclaiming Jesus, but how do you know it's true? How do you know it's true? A miracle, the word miracle in the Greek, it means an attesting sign, an attesting sign. In other words, there were words, but how do you know those words are true? They saw works, attesting signs, miracles. In chapter three, it's the case of healing. Uh, my, my story of my daughter in the picture is an attesting sign. What is a miracle? It's just a testing sign. It says that what you say is validated by what you see, what you experience, what God does, and or what you do for others. It's an attesting sign. In our society today, we got a lot of words, right? But not a lot of works. It's a both and, not an either or. Miracles are just attesting signs. And here in the Acts, yes, we see tremendous miracles. We've already seen in the Gospels the raising of, of Lazarus, for instance, from the dead, right? Which proves, if you will, Jesus had power over the grave. When he helped to raise a man to walk who couldn't walk, it proved he could forgive sins, right? Here in Acts 3, Peter performs a miracle. God, through Peter, heals a man, right? And it causes some commotion. Peter didn't heal him. God, through Peter, healed him. But what I want you to understand is the healing isn't the miracle so much. It's an attesting sign. And why I say that is because God is working in and through you and I individually and collectively as a church. He is working through us, and he wants to work through us to do miracles, even in our time. Now, sometimes those are sensational, let's call them miracles, right? Like in our midst as a church, we have actually physically seen people healed. Not seen them healed in our eyes, but one day they've got 100 cancer lesions. And the next day, and we pray for them, and the next day all those lesions are gone out of nowhere. Validated by, by the melanoma clinic over here at the University of Arkansas, medical sciences. Like we've seen that. But does that happen thousands and thousands of times? No. Sometimes we pray for people and they don't get healed. Right? But sometimes that happens. But those are, let's call those for a moment, sensational miracles. Those happen. God is still working like he did 2,000 years ago. But the most of the miracles we see today are just day to day, you being you and representing Jesus well. Bringing faith, bringing hope, bringing love and life to people. We see miracles through the orchard, through Miss George's chess club, out on the bus with Fresh to You, and other things that the church collectively does. We see miracles. In other words, God is attesting, you see? He's attesting through our work that what we say is true. When we say God loves all people, you know what the, one, you know what the biggest miracle is? Look around this room, seriously. I'm not just making that up. Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21, Paul is speaking specifically about diverse men and women walking, working, worshiping God together as one. And he says, and now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you could ever ask, think, or imagine. What he's saying is that you will never ever, if I could put it in our context, you'll never ever see a black man and a white man go to church together three miles from Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, only God. See what I'm saying? That's what he's saying. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing to help you feel what Paul was saying. That's a miracle. That's an, and what is the miracle? It's an attesting sign. What is he attesting? Our word that God, in fact, loves all people. Our word that the kingdom of heaven is for all people. Our word that the local church is for all people. It's an attesting sign. It's a miracle. And God is working miracles in and through you and us to this day. In chapter four, because of this word and because of this work, you see the beginning of harassment. So first, they're just harassed by these Jewish leaders. It's going to escalate, right? 
Chapter four, the church is selling, laying things at the apostles' feet. By the end of the chapter, we're introduced to a man named Barnabas who will play a specific role down the road in the formation of the church at Antioch. Acts chapter five, a man named Ananias and Sapphira, you've heard them, they get featured a lot, right, in Acts five, because when all the church was selling their goods and laying at the apostles' feet for distribution to help out the community, as it were, the community of faith within the church, uh, these two people pretended that they were giving everything they sold, but actually kept a portion for themselves. And the Bible says they were struck dead in the midst of the assembly. Now, um, if, if, if the key point of that story was the wrath of God, when you make a mistake or you lie, you get struck dead, none of us would be here. You see what I'm saying? I'd be like, Paul, chief among sinners. I, I'm dead. I'm long ago dead if that's what that story's teaching. That's not what that story's teaching. But it was an early example of the church. What was it teaching the church? Hey, man, this stuff is serious. This is life or death serious here. And the story, or what that story is really teaching the church is not only it's serious, but there has to be trust among us. If we're gonna be of one mind, one will, one purpose, and advance the cause of Christ, we've gotta trust each other, right? You've gotta have transparency. You got, it wouldn't have been a big deal if they said they were kept, but they didn't. So it was all about trust and transparency because we're, in a sense, going to spiritual war here. And we gotta have each other's backs. So trust and transparency, developing one heart, one mind, one um, soul and purpose, that's what the church was to do and that story teaches us that, right? And again, some more signs and wonders uh, later on in that, that chapter. By the time you get to 517, the, the harassment escalates to actual persecution. The apostles are arrested, they're put into prison, and, and later they're released and they're flogged. So this is the first time now there, there's some suffering, there's some physical punishment for expressing faith in Christ. But a key point at the end of five is a man named Gamaliel who is a Jewish leader. And the Jewish leaders wanted to kill them. They wanted to go beyond flogging. They wanted to kill the apostles and put to death this thing called the way. But this, this Jewish uh, man named Gamaliel who's a part of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling body, he said, look, if God's for this thing, you can't stop it. Remember we had a little hashtag uh, that, that said, uh, what was that hashtag? Uh, can't stop, won't stop. See, and Gamaliel said, if this is of God, there's not a thing you can do about it. You better just get on board, right? Um, because if it's not of him, it, it'll go out. But it is of him, don't stand in its way. And so you find this at the end of chapter five there in Acts. So what's going on is the church is growing, testimony is going out, attesting signs, and threats escalate to harassment, harassment to arrest and to flogging, and ultimately, but the church can't be stopped, 542 every day, uh, people are hearing about God in various homes in the temple. They're growing, and the church is moving on. Six and seven, of course, the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. So harassment, flogging, see what I'm saying? Imprisonment, and ultimately now the first person who was killed for his faith. Stephen never saw Jesus, but he had had an encounter, and he went to death proclaiming him. Six and, uh, that's chapter six and seven. Chapter eight, we hear about this man named Saul. Saul is a persecutor of the church. He's called Saul because he was a Jew. Later, we're gonna know him as who? Paul. What that means and, and, and what that's like is that Saul, it, it'd be like this to put it in our term. I'm, I'm white from a white mother. My father was Italian, Russian Jew, but I'm white. And so here's the deal. If I had a white name, okay, and, and most of my life was lived with whites and white and all that church, and I had a white name that whites knew me by, but then I start this church over 20 years and I build relationships and I got all these diverse friends and relationships and, and develop cross-cultural competence and experience. I'm known by a different name, a name that transcends my whiteness and that all of us can relate to, that I, I more identify with all people than I do with one people. Does that make sense? That's why his name was changed to Paul. Saul means I identify with the Jews. Paul is I'm a man for all people, just like my God is a God for all people. And we're introduced to Paul in chapter eight, right? Also there we see Philip, persecution in conjunction with Stephen, starts driving some of the apostles and deacons out. Philip heads north to Samaria. He leads Samaritans to the Lord, to Ethiopian eunuch. But keep in mind the Samaritans and the Ethiopians are people who have a historical connection to Judaism. So in other words, when Paul or Peter, I'm sorry, Philip is explaining Jesus out of historical Judaism, it's not a far-fetched connection that Samaritans or Ethiopians would get it. But it's only when Peter in Acts chapter 10 goes into the house of a Roman soldier named Cornelius and his, him and his entire household get saved, this is a true Gentile convert. 
This is somebody far away from God that has no understanding of God, no business of God. If you were a Roman soldier, you actually worship the Caesar because the Caesars established themselves not only as rulers but as God. And this is somebody who is a Gentile's Gentile, if I can say it like that. And Peter leads him to the Lord in Acts 10. The gospel is going from the Jew to the Ethiopian, the Samaritans, and now into the house of a Gentile Roman soldier. Acts chapter 11, the boys call Peter on the carpet for that. Like, what are you doing in a Gentile's house? That was taboo for Jews. You don't go into the house of a Gentile. It's like, you know, kosher meat and all that. There's this clear separation from Jews to Gentiles. But Peter is in his house, and Peter has to give a defense in Acts 11 for why he's in Cornelius' house. And essentially he says, look, fellas, all I know is this. I had a dream, he had a dream, we got together, and the Holy Spirit fell upon him and his household the same way he fell upon us in the beginning. Who is him and his household and us? Gentiles and Jews. And if God is choosing to move amongst the Gentiles like that, what am I supposed to do about it? Right? Acts eleven eighteen, an argument ensues. And then it says, when they heard him speak this, they quieted down. They said, well, then, I guess the gospel's for the Gentiles, too. You're almost halfway through the book of Acts before our heroes, it dawns on them that the gospel, the coming kingdom of God, and the local church are not, is not just for one kind of person. It's for all kind of people. And it's the attesting sign that Jesus, in fact, is the prince of peace, who, if lifted up, will draw all people unto himself. King of kings and Lord of lords, the attesting sign is the local church. Well, of course, then you go on in chapter 12, just to finish up, chapter 12, it escalates from just the Jewish religious leaders all the way to King Herod now. King Herod's involved, and he's so upset because the whole thing's a threat, he takes James, the son, the brother of John, that were the sons of Zebedee, and he kills James, the second martyr of the church. James, who did walk with Jesus, sons of Zebedee, he gets martyred by King Herod, but later in that chapter, very interesting, uh, in that chapter. Later on, this same king is struck dead by God. You know why? Because he brought food to a region and everybody in the region hailed him as a god because the Romans did the same thing with the Caesars, but he was a Jewish king. And rather than reject that, like later in Acts, they're gonna call Paul and Barnabas gods and they say, hey man, we are not gods. Don't be calling us gods. But in this place, they called Herod God for feeding him and he's like, all right, they wanna worship me. Boom, he was done, just like that. So he got struck dead for taking the glory away from God. So again, he killed James, but he got killed because you can't stop this thing that God is doing, right? Acts 13, one, leadership at Antioch is multi-ethnic, two from Africa, one from the Middle East, one from the Mediterranean, one from Asia Minor. It's a model for the church. If we're gonna reflect the community, we are diverse, our leadership reflects that diversity. The people of our community see us as leaders, walking, working, worshiping God, respecting one another, responsible authority, sharing power, position, and privilege, not just contained with one person or one people group. We get that out of Acts 13, and of course in that chapter then, they uh, commissioned Paul and Barnabas to go out of Antioch, this multi-ethnic church we've talked about enough, I skipped over it for now in Acts 11, 19, and following. They commissioned Paul and Barnabas to go on what's called the first of three missionary journeys where now the gospel is going out intentionally into the Gentile world from the church at Antioch, which is the church that we're patterned after. Acts 11, 19, 26, and 27, and when the, uh, I'm sorry, 19 through 26, where, where persecution of Jerusalem led people to flee to different cities. One of them was Antioch, the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And, and for the first time, it says Jew, uh, that people targeted both Jews and Gentiles to share the gospel. And when thousands came to Christ there, it wasn't thousands of the same kind of people, it was thousands of all kinds of people. And it was from Antioch that the church goes forth throughout the world. We patterned ourselves 16, 17 years ago, not on the church of Jerusalem, but on the church at Antioch, to be a church for all people, to express the love of God in real and tangible ways to our community through our good deeds of walking, working, and worshiping God together as one. So what are some of the threads through all this, just to finish up? Well, as a church grows, so often escalates the, the threat, the persecution, the harassment that goes with that message that can't be stopped. But no matter what you do, you can't stop it, as we've seen today. Many have come and gone. They burn Bibles. They ban Bibles. They burn the church. They, they kill people. But see, Stephen and those early people set it up. In fact, when the apostles were, flat, uh, were, uh, were flogged, it says they went away rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. And that set up a 2,000 years precedent. When you suffer, you give him the glory. If you're willing to give him the glory in the good times, you give it in the hard times too. 
and they establish that at Antioch. So this can happen. But beyond that, not only uh, does the church grow and harassment can escalate, you can't stop it. Often when the church is persecuted, it grows. We see that in our time. But it also, one of the threads is this, it's not just numeric or regional growth uh, that Luke is reporting, but it's that ethnic diversity as we talked about, that this is a worldwide movement, not just a local or single ethnic group movement. And lastly, and this is what I wanna finish with, what you see in, in these people, in the story of, of the, the people, and the story of the, uh, of the church, what you see, everybody say this word with me, commitment, commitment. They had had an encounter with Jesus, it had changed their life, and they were passionately committed. Passionately committed to the gospel. Passionately committed to telling others and serving others. To, and passionately committed to one another uh, to advance his name. And, and that's really what I want to ask you and finish up today as we head back into the book of Acts. In our lifetime, it seems to me, and I've been a pastor 34 years, a Christian 38. It feels like in our day and age and in our lifetime, for many, many people who call themselves Christians in America, that they willingly give, give Jesus a piece of their lives, a portion of their time, but they don't give Jesus everything. See, what you read about in these people is it wasn't just a piece or a portion of their life. They were committed. It was everything. And you don't have to be a paid pastor or in ministry to give your life away, to worshiping God, to walking with others of like mind, to serving him through good works. But this is what they were like. Perhaps we don't see the kinds of miracles we see here because in our lifetime, we only give pieces and portions of our lives away. We don't give the whole commitment. And that's really the challenge for us. Easter is a big celebration, and we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But the question is not what you say about him, it's what you will do and how you will then live for him. So because you have seen him, because you do know him, because you are living your life with and for him, telling others about him, we raise our children to worship him, we endure hardship and suffering by trusting in him, we expect one day to be with him. Will that be the marks of your life? and of this church. This church is not alone. We're a part of human history. We're a part of his story. What a great time to be alive and our church to be a part of this movement. And what acts, I wonder, if they wrote a book of acts about your life and mine, about our collective church, what would that story say? As we leave here today, let us commit ourselves anew to him, not just pieces and portions of our lives, but commit ourselves wholly to him, holy to one another, holy to the mission of the kingdom of God and of this church. How do you do that? Be committed. Come to church on Sundays. Just a simple thing. Gather with the saints. We're teaching, fellowship, breaking bread. Get involved in a small group, in a circle with soul sisters. Other ways to get involved in building fellowship and relationships. And lastly, commit yourself to serve, whether in here or outside the church, through our programs, whatever. But you know what that is called? Worship, walk, and work. Worship God together as one, walk together as one, work for him together. That's as simple as that. And it takes not just portions and pieces, but commitment for our story to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen.